The discussion today is called the new space age. Now, when thinking about the discussion, I was thinking about the world that we currently inhabit, and it doesn't look too good. You know, in an age of overpopulation, global warming, possible AI gone wrong, viruses, Kanye West. <laughs> I, I can do better. Valery Simeonov is still around. <laughs> So the, the, the basic question is who in their right mind would want to stay on this planet? You know, each one of us has asked themselves this question. And the question is obvious to all of us. You know, it's, uh, it's either an, um, you know, an evolutionary law that we, that, we, that we have to do it, or it is something that is driven by our inherent you know, desire to discover new things. And there is one more uh, very good reason. I think Warren Ellis, the famous comic book writer, has put it very, very well when, when he said that keeping all your breeding pairs in a single planet is a retarded way to run a species. You know, so, so we basically have to do that. Now the question, how are we going to do that? The challenges that, are we go that we're going to face, and afterwards when we actually start inhabiting planets, what are the places that we're going to be living in? is the subject of this discussion. Now, we have invited here a few people to discuss these matters with me. We have Sebastian Fredrickson, uh, who is an architect, he's an entrepreneur, and he is also the co-founder of Saga Architects. It's a design studio which is focused on, uh, especially on designing uh, cosmic habitats, habitats on other planets. Uh, he's also one of the one of the guys uh, which, uh, whom we should thank, thank about the simulation that we have outside, you know, the Mars Space Group. Um, we also have Diego Urbina, who has participated in an extremely odd experiment and a very difficult one, I think. So it is the longest simulation of a prolonged space flight ever done in human history. So he will tell us a little bit more during the conversation, but essentially he was enclosed for more than 500 days without going anywhere with a bunch of other people simulating a space flight. So he's a quite, quite interesting guy. And we also have uh, Vladi Bozilov, uh, who's our Bulgarian lecturer today. And uh, Vladi is, uh, he's teaching uh, in the astronomy department at Sofia University. And he's also a popularizer <laughs> of science as well. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome our panel. Hey guys, um, first I would like to start off with the, with the following. You know, we have to make a historical introduction. So we went through the first space age. It essentially started with uh, the launch of Sputnik yeah. in 1957. I think the ending point is considered to be the last moon flight. Apollo 17, yeah, 1972. correct me if I'm wrong, in 1972. Now it is widely accepted that now we live in the second space age. Now Diego, can you, Quickly tell us, you know, what is the second space age all about and how is it different from the first one? Well, for us, um, when, when we went to the moon, we went, uh, it, it was a, a very valuable experience and it was a first thing, uh, first uh, event for humankind, very special moment. But we went there only to, you know, put our boots, plant flags, go back, um, just to show the, the, the Soviet Union and so on that, uh, we could do it, I mean that the US could do it. Um, and uh, now what we want to do is approach it differently. What we want to do is doing it sustainably, um, going there to stay, be it that is the moon, be it that is, uh, is lunar space, or be it that is Mars, but that we can go and, and actually build up on it and make it an integral part of, of our civilization. That's, that's more or less what, what it is for me, but there's many other things going on uh, in, the, in low Earth orbit, cheap access to space so that anybody can send their own satellites. Uh, so it's, I think we're living in very, very exciting times. So essentially the essence is that during the first space age, governments were the main driving force. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we do have private enterprise and we all talk about Elon Musk and all kinds of other entrepreneurs uh, yeah, who we expect uh, yeah. more. Well, actually, I agree with Diego. So the first space age was about competition, and this competition was funded by countries, by governments. But this new space age is actually a cooperation between governments and private 
private companies. And I think this is a revolution. So it's about satisfying our curiosity and actually providing a way to survive outside of our planet. So I think it's uh, really go there to stay. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Now, is this an imperative? Do we have to go there and stay? Why don't we focus on our own planet? Um, I think, I think it's, uh, it's like an evolutionary foundation in the human always to explore. You know, otherwise we would probably never have left like the African continent, right? It's like, it's just in our DNA to go out and explore. So I think it's, in a way it's like, Inevitable. Yeah. But do we have the capabilities of doing that at this at this current stage? Well, it depends. It depends. So I I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's necessary, but we have to try hard. Actually, if we see what we are doing here on our planet, if we see the dangers that our technology actually can, uh, if we have a technological breakdown, it will be a complete disaster. So right now we have a choice, the way I see it. So we can use the technology to go there and invest in, in, in space research, or actually we can try to have a sustainable future here on our planet. And this is a good thing. I think we can do both. We can have sustainable future on Earth, and we can also try to go there and colonize other bodies in space. And we have the technology. It's, it's expensive. I think that one of the best examples will be a colony on Mars. It's, it's doable, it's very expensive, and there, there, there are much things that need to be settled down before we can say, next year we will go to a holiday on Mars. So first we need a way to safely land heavy world on Mars. This is not settled, we don't know how to do it. We right. can land about uh, one ton, 100 kilograms on Mars safely. Also, how to survive on Mars in the long term? Well, it's, uh, we, we don't know if the resources that will be there will be sufficient. And I think that we have to do it, we have the technology, but we need to advance this technology much further. Okay, let's cover something, something very quickly. Um, it seems like an obvious question, but why Mars and why the Moon? Um, first, I would just uh, like to say for the other thing, I think it's also important to say we don't have to do one or the other, right? We can do both at the same time. And a lot of the spin-off technologies that happen from, you know, uh, space exploration is actually used for a better planet here on Earth. You know, Earth is a beautiful place. Yeah, this, this thing is it's a, a false question that gets always uh, asked. Uh, why do we do space if we have so many problems on Earth? So everybody will agree that we have problems on Earth, but uh, it's, we, one should not exclude the other. We, we should not be just focusing on one thing just because there are some problems and not do the other thing. If many things, our future will depend on this other thing and we might not perceive it immediately, but in the future we will. And I think one of the reasons for this dichotomy is that humanity has a very short uh, attention span. You know, we do need to, f you know, people think that we need to focus on one or the other because we will not be capable of doing both because we can't focus on so many areas and there is a lot of investment to be done. Um, but anyways... Just, you know, just like the dinosaurs. Like just like <laughs> the dinosaurs, yeah. And the then now they're extinct, extinct because right. they didn't have a space program. But, but right. do you think it's about attention span? Well, I think it's, it's, it's about uh, curiosity. Right. So if we have the curiosity, we can do both things and also invest in new, new areas like personal medicine and stuff. So I think that it's about provoking curiosity. And here the role of education is very important. Right. Yeah, so it's not only about attention. Right. Okay, so uh, we select the rocky planets. Is it only because they're nearby? Well, uh, let's talk about Mars, for example. I think it's, it's, it's also a great example. There's a lot of similarities to Earth. Uh, the gravity is not completely far off. Now, you, some of you have tried a, a similar gravity experience out in the pavilion, but it's about 32% uh, of what it is on Earth, um, whereas, for example, the Moon is, is, is about a sixth, right? Yeah. Um, but also the, the, the day and night cycle on, on Mars is about 25 hours, uh, which is very similar to, to the 24 hours we have here on, on Earth, which makes it easier for plants and, and, and life to exist there. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, Mars, Mars is a fantastic place, and it's uh, where we all should keep our sights on. Uh, but often the, the, the moon doesn't get enough love, you know? <laughs> the, the, the moon is a wonderful place. They, yeah. they, they say, some people say, uh, if God wanted humans to be multiplanetary, 
he would have given humans a moon, mm. which is the case. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it's there, it's very close. It can serve as a, as a testing ground for going and doing amazing stuff on Mars in the future. It's, it's a fantastic stepping stone. It has, it has amazing resources. We, we, when the Apollo missions happened, we used to think this place is completely dry. There's nothing there. There's nothing we can do there except planting a flag. And with years, scientists have learned that there are incredible things going on there. The, they found out that there is ice in the, in the, in the poles of the moon. Um, and that uh, this ice, so it's water that we can extract, we can uh, produce oxygen with it, uh, we can have astronauts drinking that water, and uh, that, that solves one of our biggest problems, which is bringing so much mass into space that is very, very expensive. Uh, we, we can just get that from space, and uh, that, that could solve many of, of, of the blockades that we have currently for expanding into the solar system. So when you said it's very expensive and if we decide we, we can't do this, we can't say, uh, send everything that we need and, and build it there on spot, how are we going to do it? Are we going to send robots and 3D printers? or I mean, is that my, one way to, uh, to do that? Oh, it has to be humans. Well, uh, I think we definitely should start with robots. But uh, one thing I'd like to add is that the moon is very important. So I also think that we need to start using the moon as a test bed for our ideas, for our technologies, and then go to colonize Mars. And of course, we can do this in the same time. We can do these things simultaneously. But the moon is very close. This means that for the first run of moon colonizers. We can send the water from Earth to the moon. It's expensive, but it's doable. Because on Mars, we definitely need to have uh, sustainable resources. We need to have a system to use the water on Mars. There is water on Mars, ice is in the power, power caps, and also liquid water under the south pole. So we have water there, but it will be too expensive. It will be, I would say, impossible to deliver water and food from Earth to Mars. To for the moon, we can do it. And also, one thing that we need to concentrate on, so we have four rocky planets in the solar system. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And of course, we, we, we can ask why not Mercury or Venus? So it's, it's, uh, it's obvious when you know the details about those planets that Mercury is very close to the sun, so it would be like, uh, like a very, very extremely hot death bath for everyone who goes there. And on Venus, you have a, re a runaway greenhouse effect. So every colonizer will be dead immediately. That's why we only have two choices, Earth, and we are here, and Mar Mars. So this is, uh, this is why Mars is the obvious choice for our future colonization. Now, Sebastian, what are the things that you guys consider when you're designing a habitat? Considering all the things that can actually kill us, you can briefly <laughs> cover those. And as well, if you can cover the, whether we have the technology of extracting you know, these resources and, and using them properly. Well, so uh, there's, uh, there's many things that can kill us in space right now. Um, uh, but of course, one of the biggest problems uh, and here we see one of our habitats designed for the moon. Um, on, on the moon, there's, there's no atmosphere. There's a vacuum, well, near vacuum. And this means that you need to create your own atmosphere. So within this, uh, this habitat, which is an inflatable habitat, uh, you know, there's, there's basically two ways you can do space architecture. Primarily, you can bring everything from Earth, like we talked about, um, or you can use the resources available. This habitat we designed for, uh, for, for a case in the near future where the, we are not ready yet, the technology is not completely mature yet to, to, to utilize the materials in the, in the ground. Um, so therefore we, we created the habitat that we flew from Earth, uh, or that could be flown from Earth to the moon. Um, so, so what you see here is, uh, it's almost like an origami uh, habitat. It unfolds, um, and that's smart because like you say, it's, you, we, we can bring things to the moon, but it's extremely expensive right now. Um, so you want to bring lightweight, compact, but of course that's not very pleasant to live in. Uh, so therefore we, we want to get as much space out of uh, the, the small things that we bring. Uh, and therefore like an unfoldable structure is, is, is really good. 
Um, but some of the other things that can kill us is, is radiation. Radiation is a big problem. Uh, you will quickly develop cancer, and if, if, if we don't find a good solution for that, we, we most likely will not survive the, the, the journey to Mars. Um, and, and one of the ways that we have worked with protecting for that, for, uh, for example, a Mars habitat or a Mars colony, is actually protecting the people on the surface under like an, an ice cap, uh, because water and the hydrogen in water is uh, very good as, as radiation protection. Well, uh, we, we will survive. We will survive the trip, but the problem is when you are settling down on Mars. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So I like that you bring this habitat up because I, I think it's a really clever idea. This uh, um, infinite. Uh, yeah, it's inspired by the Mobius trip. Like it's uh, it's really clever. In the, uh, during my simulation, we we uh, I used to walk a lot, like moving across the models a lot, f back and forth again and again and again, just to have a feeling of having more space that I didn't really have. And I think that one idea like that would be extremely useful in a future habitat. Um, in the, in, and, and now that you mentioned that, that you want to dig these kind of habitats inside the ground, that's, that's, that's one really good idea to cover it from, from radiation. One of the other approaches that we're thinking of is, is grabbing one of those clever inflatable habitats and uh, uh, being able to build bricks on the moon, um, so that the, that the habit, the pressurized habitat, is not necessarily made of uh, the, the 3D printed regolith, but you can build structures around. And for that, we have this uh, project Regolite. I, maybe there's a video about it, uh, where uh, basically we build this gantry 3D printer uh, that y makes a use of the resources on the moon because uh, you can use the sunlight. Uh, to 3D print instead of uh, instead of uh, other forms of energy. Um, that's probably the, other, the video. Can you just briefly cover, sorry for interrupting, the concept yes. of what is regolith? Because it's a very important. Yeah, so regolith is the is the is the dirt on the soil that you find. And uh, what, what what we found out is that if you see dirt that regolith, so if you apply directed energy of concentrated solar light, you can make it solid. Um, and then if you spread a layer of, of regolith on the ground and then m make your pattern like a normal 3D printer, then spread another layer and sinter again, then you can build bricks that then you can use to build uh, structures around these habitats of uh, perhaps, uh, probably the minimum is three meters so that you don't, uh, you don't you get protected enough from the radi radiation. Uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, in situ resource utilization. So we're not yet ready to build a habitat like that um, with, uh, you know, the metallic structures and everything. That's, that's very, very hard as of today. But we are coming close to the point where we can build like brick, very simple bricks that can help us. Yeah. And so will that be necessary from an architectural standpoint? Well, yeah, to be sustainable in space, that's, that's very necessary. Uh, you need to learn how to get all the minerals or, or use the, the regulator itself to, to, to build with. Yeah. You did say in a previous conversation that uh, in space and in, in the moon and on other planets, things are essentially decaying slower, meaning that they, they, they maintain their structural uh, strength for longer. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's interesting, right, because there's a lot of difficulties in space, but there's also some possibilities. For example, the, the, the lower gravity also makes uh, beams span longer, for example, right? Like the the material strength is is, is the same, but but the uh, the gravity is less, right? So you could you could have roofs that span wider. Uh, so so it it also gives you more uh, possibilities when you design. Right. So in terms of shapes, yeah. is there an optimal shape? And the reason I'm asking is that in popular culture we usually see these domes that are being built. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason for that? Yeah, so there's a, a very good reason for that, and it makes complete sense. It's a, it's a good pressure form, right? So you don't have an atmosphere, so you need to create your own atmosphere. Um, the, the, you know, from an architectural standpoint, I think it's a little sad sometimes that everything looks like bubbles. Um, so so uh, in, in our architecture, we really tried to challenge that. Uh, so we made this, this Mobius, which is actually quite a complex uh, geometry, but it still unfolds, and it's a pressure form. Uh, but it's really difficult to think about uh, new shapes that are uh, good pressure forms. Uh, 
And yeah. what was the shape of the Mars 500 habitat? What was the shape of the so habitat? The, the shape is based on what you can fit in a rocket. So basically, right. it's very close to what you have in the International Space Station, that you have these cylindrical modules um, and that they are connected to each other. You can see them. Um, we had this medical model that you see there perpendicular, uh, the living model, which is the, the storage model, which is the longest. The living model, which is the longest, the storage one is close to the living one. Uh, and we had a, a lander, and, um, and then we were connected to a Martian surface where we run sim uh, simulations of spacewalks during two weeks in the whole mission. Uh, so it's, 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 very, it's fairly narrow, so it's, uh, it's, it's really the, the, the shape of the International Space Station models. Diego, just to take a step back, can you brief us on what M Mars 500 yeah, is? Idea. What is the <laughs> yes. experiment about? So uh, Mars 500 was uh, a simulation organized by the Russian government, by the European Space Agency, and the Chinese government. Um, and uh, the idea is uh, to simulate the isolation and confinement of a trip to Mars, which is what we can simulate on Earth. There are some things that we could not simulate, like the radiation um, and the gravity. Uh, of the trip, so the absence of gravity, but everything else we simulated as close as possible, so the communications, the operations, um, and uh, the, it was a, a, a simulation of one year and a half, so eight months to go, a few weeks on the surface of Mars, and eight months to come back, uh, and, and we had all the constraints of the real mission, especially from the point of view of communications. Uh, what you will find when you go on a trip to Mars is that as, as, as you get really far from Earth, uh, the distance becomes really important, and because of the, the uh, speed of light, the limits in the speed of light, your communications had a speed limit. So uh, at some point, you will find yourself uh, being able to send messages and people receiving it on Earth uh, 20 minutes later. And then they would need to analyze your message and uh, prepare an answer, and then they would reply to you, and you would get this answer 20 minutes after they send it. So. Clearly, what this means is that you need a level of autonomy there. You cannot just receive instructions. You need to know what to do, um, and that, that will make a huge difference. Uh, so we, we were there, three Russians, uh, one Chinese, uh, a Frenchman, and myself. Uh, and yeah, we survived. Uh, we made it to the end. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, uh, because I remember the thought of Sartre, who said that hell is other people. And it, it does seem like you went through hell there. <laughs> so just to, ju just to recap, you were closed for more than five, for 500 days, exactly? 520 well, days. For 520 days. The 20 are very important. <laughs> <laughs> right. With six people in a very Eastern European looking like an apartment <laughs> without windows. Very Russian, very Eastern European. Yeah. Very Eastern European, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It was lovely. These, the, uh, there's these wooden panels that really cut, catch your attention, uh, and psychologically, I found them very pleasant. I would say, if it was just a flat uh, metal panel, uh, that would be a little bit sad. Uh, so it, it was nice. Uh, it's not necessarily what you will use on a real mission, but nothing prevents you from using something that looks like wood. So. Right. Uh, to us, it looks depressingly nostalgic. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really horrible. Okay. I've seen other photos in which you can see the rugs, and it was so Russian-like that it's, it's incredible that they didn't, didn't consider that. OK, so uh, we're going to go back to this experiment in a little while, because it's very interesting on what it does to your brain. But uh, what we know from space travel, uh, what was the, um, do you remember the, the, the record of, uh, I think it was a Russian guy who spent how many days was he in space? I think it, uh, well, I can't remember the, the exact name of the astronaut, but I think it was about 400 days, more than one year in space. Valery Polyakov. Ah, Polyakov, yeah, yeah, Polyakov. thank you, thank so, you. So, so it was what four, do we know? 400 days, 400 maybe, days. Maybe close to 400, close, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was on Mir space station, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so what do we know? What happens to the human body? Well, bad things happen to the human body. <laughs> so actually, gravity is very important for us, and if you stay long time in space, first you, you are losing your strength. So the bones get, uh, are losing the calcium, your muscles, you have to train the muscles. I, I think every one of our guests know that astronauts train every day. I was actually curious uh, what was the daily routine on Mars 500, maybe we can come back on that later. But you, you're losing bone mass, you're losing muscles, and also there, there are 
actually problems with the eyes. When you come back, you may have problems with the pressure on the eyes. And these are the effects that we know of. But there are many things that we don't know. For example, if we are to colonize Mars, we need to think of reproduction of the human species on Mars. And this is not straightforward because gravity on Mars is about 37, 38% of the gravity on Earth. And this means that when the embryo is uh, developing, we have, maybe we might have problems. Also, pumping the blood to our heart in the long term will be different and maybe our muscles, our heart won't be strong enough to survive a long term stay on Mars. So these are just few of the things we don't know. But sex seems to be exciting and well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Actually, no one in has haven't have sex in space. That we know of. That, that, that we, we know of. of. <laughs> that we know of. That we know of. Yeah, that we know of. Yeah, that we know of. Because well, this is the official couple, science statement here. Yeah. There's a couple uh, that went into space without people actually knowing they were a couple on the shuttle, back in the shuttle days. Yeah, but... Uh, and so, so maybe but they've tried, maybe they've tried. It's a very yeah. small and there's other people as well, so, but maybe they close their eyes, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, but, but we need experiments. Yeah, I think that it's, it's a very important experiment, really. Yeah. The Chinese probably did it already somewhere or another. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. There is no ethics with yeah. these guys. Well, well, you can have unethical sex. Yeah. Ethical sex, definitely. <laughs> unethical, I unethical also. I, I think we are, we are sliding off topic a little bit. <laughs> um, Okay, so now that we have covered the physiological, let's talk about psycho psychological. So in terms of design, what is it that you can do to ease the condition of, of this enclosed environment? And especially if it's built this way. Yeah. Right, um, well actually, I think it's interesting that we talked about the wood because I think one of the misconceptions is when you create a spacecraft, and we all know this uh, sci-fi design and this minimalism and these chairs, right? They're very like futuristic. But, I, but the thing is, like, it's made of plastic. It is when you sit in it, it becomes a little bit sweaty and it's not so nice and it's artificial. And I think if you're like, if, if you're on a spaceship and you're there for a long time, the things that you actually need is uh, is wood and and warm materials and fabrics and and pleasant materials and not all those like you said like the aluminium and and these uh, these different kinds so so working with the materials uh, i would say is, is is very good then of course getting the most out of the, the space that's available um and then maybe one of the most important things some of the astronauts and and i think you guys you did something similar is you uh, you, you missed nature right mm -hmm. i assume and um, some of the astronauts, they're listening to, to nature sounds when they're going to sleep, for example. And I know, know that, that one, one astronaut went so far, he listened to mosquito sounds, like mosquitoes humming, <laughs> which might be the most unpleasant sound I know on Earth, but uh, <laughs> when you're trying to fall asleep. But, but you know, so, so you're missing this, and there's a theory about it called the biophilia, mm -hmm. that, that living things uh, miss other living things. Um, so mm -hmm. getting a lot of nature and plants into the habitat would be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Diego, you were surrounded by living things. <laughs> by humans, <laughs> yeah. By humans. <laughs> Just five of them, yeah. Tell but us about that. Yeah, that's, that's actually uh, interesting because they, they were amazing people. Probably the best, the only guys that I would pick to live with uh, like this. Mm. Uh, but then the thing that I missed the most was meeting new people, like mm. uh, getting, getting to talk to other people, getting... Just, just uh, when I go out in the street, the fact that somebody just looks or somebody just says hi, and that normally I just take for granted, and then when I came out, I was like, wow, this is the best feeling in the world. <laughs> so, uh, th th yeah, you, know, you miss nature and, and, peop and other people. Um, and this is, this is uh, so some people want to go, for example, to Mars to, to, to live there forever um, in, a, in a small crew of uh, five, six people. Um, and uh, this is something that if you asked me before the simulation, I would have told you, yeah, I want to go there. So that, that's how crazy I was, and that's why I went into the simulation. Uh, but then after the simulation, I realized that, actually, no, I w if I go, I want to come back. It's very <laughs> nice, this planet. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to go there and expand, but for sure you're gonna need more than five people to live uh, in a psychologically okay condition, yeah. So why these five people? I'm sure many people, um, when they saw the picture, they asked themselves why there isn't any female on board. 
So was there any reasoning behind uh, first the sex behind the, uh, or the gender, let me put it this way, and, and, and the culture? Well, I, I was not in, ch in, ch in charge of the selection, so I cannot tell, but uh, I know that there were women in the selection process. Uh, and also what I can tell is that I'm sure that the, uh, if you introduce a mixed gender crew that introduces a whole new level of uh, different uh, situations. Um, <laughs> what do you mean, Diego? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it, it's different social dynamics between, between genders, <laughs> as you might know. <laughs> and, um, that was some verbal jujitsu, well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it, it, it's, I, could, I would say it's, uh, from a certain point of view, it's arguably easier to have full female or full male, um, but it would, I think also, it has its advantages to have a mixed group psychologically, I would say. You, you, you miss, as I was saying, you miss what the other gender also it, uh, it provides, what it has to say, the point of view, everything. Uh, so, and I, and I also think that when the mission to Mars will happen, for sure it will be a mixed crew. Mm -hmm. Like this is certain. So we, this is important that we study it now, what, how to best approach this, so that when it happens, we, we get it right. So how about from a cultural standpoint? You say the Chinese, two Russians, you're an Italo-Colombian, and um, am I missing something? And, uh, uh, Chinese, Russian, French. French, yeah. I, miss, I miss the French. So how, does, uh, how did that mixture work now? Well, it, it worked well. Uh, it's, it's, uh, clearly, there's completely different cultures, uh, completely different approaches to work, completely different uh, experiences, which makes it, in a way, a little bit more difficult, but in a way, better because you get less bored, this is, <laughs> uh, this is nice. Um, and, and you learn a lot. Uh, and uh, when there are issues, you, there's always a way out of it if, if you pick the right crew. Uh, one example was when, um, it's, it's, it's a curious anecdote because the, the, one of the Russians, he, he, I don't know if it happens in Bulgaria, but after dinner you have tea. And uh, they have tea, and uh, when they have tea, they like to talk a lot. <laughs> but when they're having dinner, they don't want to talk, or at least he didn't. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, I'm flexible, I can do whatever. <laughs> but the French guy, he really liked to talk at the, at the table for dinner. <laughs> so you know there, this can generate some friction. <laughs> um, uh, so at the end, what we figured out is, okay, what if we make the French come to the table later <laughs> so that he has dinner while the Russian guy is having tea, and then we fix the, sh the issue. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> yeah, it was perfect. Did you actually have to do that? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a clever way to sort out the things. It's a clever yeah. way, right? It didn't happen like, okay, no, now you don't go. It was kind of natural. We figured out that that was... The it's like, do. come later, come later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your daily routine before dinner? I mean, what were you doing during the days on Mars 500? Well, it was, it was the typical routine. Like we had eight hours of work, mm -hmm. eight hours of free time, and eight hours sleeping, which is mm -hmm. close to the, what you have in real life, except that the eight hours of free time, we could not just go for beers with our <laughs> friends. So there was, uh, there was a lot of work, but then during this free time, we could do... I love that free time because I, I could do wh what I always wished I could do in real life. I never had time to, so I read a lot of books. I read 27 books in one year and a half that I would never do in real life. And uh, I, I learned to draw, I learned some Russian. It was, I, I never got bored, which some, some people wonder. I never got bored and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work, but a lot of uh, interesting stuff. It was like a parallel universe life, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So he, here's a speculation. I read in a book somewhere, it was a popular science book, um, about um, some sort of a conference, I'm sorry for not giving any uh, tangible facts here, but there was a conference in which different scientists and sociologists were discussing of what are the type of people that we're going to send out in outer space uh, in order for humanity to continue its journey. And as far as I remember, the end result of this whole conference and, uh, and of these discussions was Mormons. 
they decided that Mormons are the best group. And the reason for that is that they have a fairly liberal religion, you know, no discrimination against uh, you know, gays, no problem with science, no problem with abortion. They can build very strong communities, and they're essentially very, very kind people. So it was Mormons, according to this specific conference, for which I can't provide details, so it might be Bush. Uh, is, this, is this published in an impact factor journal? <laughs> yeah. I don't think so, yeah. but I'm going to find the article and yeah, send it to you. Yeah, but the reason yeah. I'm saying that is I want to pass the question to you. So you went through that, and you, know, you guys feel free to speculate. What are the types of people that, that, that you imagine will, should we pack in a huge spacecraft and send them to procreate? That was one of the more reasons for the, for the Mormons as well, that they have huge families. They have 12, 13 children as well. So. Well, the first thing you need is, is a lot of gene diversity, right? right. Um, so you don't want a lot of, from the same family at least, so you want a lot of different people and yeah. a lot of different races. Yeah. Um, but you're thinking about psychological traits. As well, yeah. That's a good question. Well, you need people. I think that you need people that can that, that are not very aggressive, so that they can solve issues between them. But also need you need people that that will be strong, physically fit in in the beginning of the journey. And I think you need a lot of people because surviving Mars is hard. So so you need a lot of people. And, and you yeah sorry, no, um, you also need sick people actually. That's uh, also maybe a little counterintuitive, but. If you if 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 all are healthy and and you're not bringing any uh, any illness or uh, then then people are not going to build up any resistance. So you're actually going to develop quite a, a a weak group of people eventually. Um, so you actually need need that kind of, of of polluting the area a little bit. Yeah. I hope we would have solved the problem with disease prior to that. I don't want to bring the common cold on a spaceship. <laughs> well, you, you, you yeah. definitely need to. Yeah. yeah. Well, as good as your body gets used to it, because. Uh, when, when I went into the simulation, so it, it, it was clean, but it was not fully clean like a, like a hospital. Um, there might have been some bacteria, and I think that the bodies at some point get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, that one year and a half is the only year and a half that I've never got sick in my life. So, <laughs> like, I didn't have any cold, anything, so it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, and for, for the question of, of who should we bring, I think that people that don't mind being uncomfortable. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing to have. Um, uh, it's, a, it's especially in the first missions. The, the spaces are so reduced, and uh, you you need to be resistant to that. And and, and from a group point of view, so there are m many possible traits. But one of the important things to me is that uh, you need people that are neither too shy nor that, that they will not talk to other people and socialize in that moment where other people actually need you to do that. But there are also not so extrovert that uh, will that they allow shut up. people <laughs> <laughs> that won't shut up. Yeah. <laughs> so you need this sweet spot. Um, tell us a little, uh, a little bit more about the... Um, uh, you worked at the um, European Space Agency Center for Astronauts. I used to work there, yeah. You used to work there. Is it connected in any ways with the Mars 500? What I'm uh, asking is, are the people uh, selected specifically to, to, to continue this, this journey, or the experiment that stopped where we stopped? Uh, you, you can do afterwards whatever you want. Yeah. Um, there, there are some people that were already working in, in the space industry, like my Chinese colleague. Now he's the one who prepares the Chinese astronauts to go to the space station. Uh, my French colleague, he works at the European Astro Astronaut Center. He's the one that supports the astronauts uh, to connect with their families and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, now, uh, so I used to work there for uh, some human behavior performance courses that take place in caves. So before the astronauts get sent to the International Space Station, they're sent into these caves for six days um, to basically survive there. And uh, it's, a, it's a very dangerous place. Uh, and uh, if you need to get out of there you, uh, and you get an accident there, it takes uh, days to get you out of there. So you'd rather be very careful when you're taking a step there. Uh, so that's, that's a training that I help prepare there. And, and now what I'm doing is uh, I, I, I'm working on space resources. So um, I'm working on, the, on uh, a lunar rover that is called Love Me. Maybe there's a picture of it. 
uh, where the objective of this rover is that it goes into these permanently shadow regions of the moon. That's a very tricky th thing to do because that's one of the coldest places in the solar system um, and takes a sample of the ice. And then the idea is that we get to know whether this is um, a block of ice or is it like dirty snow or is it something else? And so that then we can figure out how to extract it from there. So uh, for that project, we're building a prototype. Maybe there's an, uh, another picture that uh, we're, te we're testing right now in Belgium. Um, so hopefully uh, in some years we will be able to fly this to the moon. You can see the drill there operating. Um, the, the, the drill drills and heats up the regolith and extracts the volatiles uh, uh, from 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 the moon. So that and and the other project I'm working on it's uh, also connected to space resources. It's called Alchemist. Maybe there's another picture of it. So basically we're working with the European Space Agency to design a payload that you see mounted on the side of this lander. And the idea is that uh, you can grab the, uh, the regolith from almost any place on the moon and uh, heat it up. You put in hydrogen, you heat it up, and you get water vapor. So you extract the oxygen from the, from the regolith. And that oxygen can be, yes, used for breathing, for propulsion. And the idea is to go to the moon before 2025 and demonstrate this, take a picture of the one cup of water that we can obtain. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, it's a demonstrator so that we can show it to the world and show that it's possible so that then there's more investment in this and then we can reduce the cost of sending things to space by orders of magnitude. One quick question. Th those are two great projects. Uh, I'm curious, how will the alchemist move it? Will jump or? How will the alchemist, sorry? We'll move, how Oh, how so that, move, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's because it's just a demonstrator. There are various ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the one that you see there, the lander just lands. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you don't see it, sorry, there's a, there's a robotic arm and it grabs the regolith. All right. It moves it into this side and then you put it into one of these reactors. So ah. it stays in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's just, you can, you can afford to do it in a very yeah. small area. Great, great. Now, in terms of uh, experimentation that you did during the during the project, um, we've all seen um, the, the the Martian, the movie Martian, who science yeah. the, the the hell out of everything. Uh, so, first, c can you tell me quickly about uh, again about the profile of the people? Was there any selection based on the on the specialization of, uh, of of the scientific background of these guys? I mean, do you need uh, like like in sci-fi movies a biologist, a psychologist, oh, uh, yes, an anthropologist? Yes, 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 yes. And that's that's and all. very important. The, I don't know if the, you can, we can show the picture of the crew. The, uh, the besides the nationalities, um, the, we had uh, a distribution, a nice distribution of roles, where um, a Chinese guy, he's a physiologist. Uh, there are two of the Russian guys that are uh, military doctors, so if there was a problem, they could, they were the first line of, uh, of uh, action. Uh, Roman, he's an engineer, a mechanical engineer, so he was taking care of the, of, the, of the spacecraft from many points of view. Our commander, Alexei, he's a Navy diver, so he's one guy that was used to work in, the, in very small capsules in the deep diving. And I'm an electronics engineer, so when there were electronics problems, computer problems, I helped uh, solve that. So you really need a, a well rounded up crew because of this autonomy that you need in there. Yeah. Right. So no random people, highly educated. Male. No, Probably. Keep, no. yeah. I mean, <laughs> not <laughs> male. Yeah. Jesus. You can have female for sure. Um, but, but at least in the first stages, you need that. Then at a later stage, when you might hopefully bring tourists or people that can pay for it and help it, help it enable it, then you might relax somehow that, but if you have a small crew, you need everybody doing something. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, while I'm looking at the picture, I, I again think of the interior, really bothers <laughs> me. <laughs> the only thing that's missing so there is an icon, <laughs> you know, like, uh. <laughs> anyways. Um, I guess my question is, when you look at photos from the International Space Station, you can see Windows. Yeah. So, in terms of space design, uh, what are what are what, what are similar things that you guys consider to ease the psychological burden that such a journey can cause? Um, well, you need to. It's it's interesting that you actually enjoy it a lot. This kind of private time for yourself to, to read books and stuff, because a lot I think a lot of people they experience boredom, astronauts and and probably some of your teammates as well. 
uh, or maybe they all enjoyed it. Um, but but uh, one of the things that was a later addition to the to the space station is is uh, the cupola, which is uh, a window. Uh, and I think now we are talking about the new space age. I think it's it's really interesting to 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 think about that. Uh, it's important to think about that. It's uh, it's more civilians in space, right? So we we are talking about uh, all the all the all the quali qualities of of these people. But I think uh, it's getting more and more normal people that are going into space, uh, and therefore the, you know healthy stimulation is more and more important. So for example, the window is 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 it's not necessary. If you want to survive in space, um, you can you can survive without. But you would see that it's one of the favorite places for the astronauts on the International Space Station to go there whenever they, they have a very packed schedule. So whenever they have a couple of minutes of free time, then they go there and then they they look at Earth and 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 and, and see how beautiful it is. Um, so so in that way, and and in these kind of architectural additions, I think become more and more important uh, as 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 the people become less and less tough astronauts and and more and more noble people. But yeah, even whoever you are, I think that these kind of things are fantastic. The psychologically, if I had a window that I could see Earth passing by, that this would be the place where I would spend all my time not uh, <laughs> learning how to draw, <laughs> you know. So uh, you had a digital window. Yeah. yeah, which is it's just a simple computer screen that we could see the Earth uh, getting smaller and Mars getting bigger, but it's a uh, it's a video no, no game, <laughs> so, uh, so it, was, it was not the same. So uh, Windows would be fantastic. I think that we would be better off if we listened to architects when <laughs> designing <laughs> spacecraft. I don't know if we engineers listen enough. I think that we should. <laughs> Did you have plans in there? I mean, I can see you had plans, yeah. but are, are these part of the experiment, or there a smart consideration of having greenery? Yeah. Um, well, your plans are important, but I think one of the most important things uh, is the monotony of space. Uh, so if there was, you know, uh, that's actually maybe the most important thing of, of space architecture, that is to uh, to kill the monotony. You know, I don't think when we hear uh, on Earth it's a rainy day and, and it's a little annoying, and then you know one day it's it's super cold, one day it's super warm. We don't we, we kind of experience those as annoyances or, or, or differences, but. Uh, in space, when everything is the same, you never feel the the wind in your face. You never feel the the rain on your body. Um, the, the, then you, you you have a hard time to place yourself in time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when when every day is the same, right? If you've tried to really study for an exam and you are in your own room, you know, for a, a couple of days, uh, then you you cannot really place yourself on what day you learned what. And 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 if you are, you know, 520 days in in a room. Um, then it can be really difficult to, to place yourself, I can imagine, in, in, in like what happened at, at, at what time. Uh, so creating those kind of novelties, those kind of small things, uh, if you could create weather inside, you know, that would be, that would be optimal. The, the, the having whatever nature is, is just fantastic. You can see the, the little flower that we had there in the corner in the, in the, in the living room, and, and I used to take care of this flower, like I was watering it, and, and during the whole mission. And now, a couple of months ago, my sister gave me a flower for my birthday. <laughs> I, let her, I let it die like within a month. <laughs> so, when, when you have these small things in this uh, very harsh environment, this, this becomes very special. And it, it, it really connects you with, with, with nature, even if it's a small thing. Yeah. Would a dog help? I'm just wondering, they, they allow the plant there, but how about a dog, a cat, a fly? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got, we were talking <laughs> backstage that you can now actually make food with flies. Like you can <laughs> raise them, pulverize them, 3D print cookies, and eat it. But you so would preserve it in space, you know, just to have to an take care of the fly. It'd be nice to the fly. Okay, yeah. I think, yeah. Like maybe I sound weird, but I think I would take care of the fly. <laughs> Yeah. So what do we what do we know about uh, animals in space? Is that a uh, feasible? Well, it's it's definitely feasible. Actually, the first experiments before sending humans in space were with animals. So it's right. uh, it's normal, and we know that animals can survive in certain conditions. It's a very good question. Can we have a pet in space? I think it's I think it's a very good idea, actually. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I would choose a dog, but I mm. think a fly is. Very, very <laughs> different, but 
interesting. It'll be funny to have a chimp on board. You know? Not so much. Who just likes to touch stuff. Yeah. I think I think you need to 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 let the pet grow up in space because it's not really going to understand what the hell is going on. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's hard to explain. Yeah, yeah it's a, it it would be nice for us, but maybe this raises some. Ethical, ethical questions. Questions, yeah. You know, you know, we have ethical questions also with the first part with the colonization. So let's imagine that there are microorganisms on Mars and we go there. So is it ethical to interfere with them? Maybe they will die because we will colonize their habitat. So this is one of the questions in space ethics right now. So it's, it's a very important question. Is it ethical to interact with the microbes? Yeah, uh, is it ethical to kill them? Because when you go there and colonize Mars, if there are microorganisms there, they will probably die. So is it ethical to kill a future Too alien bad. life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an important question right now. So. Well, definitely the microbe wouldn't think the same <laughs> way for us. You know, is it ethical yeah. to kill these people? You know, probably yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah. Solution. Actually, the solution is to search for life before going there. So right now there is a new discipline, space wall. So if uh, any of our guests today are interested in space or in wall, so there is a discipline that's combining both of those fields. And in space wall, now you have to search for alien life forms before sending people there. So this is the space ethics. I, th I thought it's part of the standard procedure. I mean, how would you? Well, we haven't found alien life so well, far, right, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't send anything to a planet without knowing if something lives there. Well, but how I can you, f how, how you define life? <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a tricky question. How, how are you sure that we are alive? That's what we think, but... I'm how, not how going there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're not going to discuss that. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's a very, very yes, it's, it's, it's tricky it's question. It's easy to, to say, yes, there is life. I found life, therefore there is life. But if you don't find it, I don't think you can say, no, there's no life, mm -hmm. like, right. there yeah. might be, so you might never be sure. And that poses also a problem, like, okay, so if we don't find it, should we go there and maybe risk interfering with, with it, killing it, or bringing it to Earth, maybe yeah. risking yeah. that? That's yeah. So, we, and we, yeah, that's, a, that's an ethical question that is posed that uh, different people think different things there, yeah. Right. It's also a problem if we bring something from from Earth that might thrive there. You know, it's like when we went to Australia, we brought uh, rabbits, right? And then they started, there was no, nothing to kill the rabbits, and then there was just millions and millions of rabbits, and that's a, a huge problem. You can expe expect some of the same things would happen uh, if you went to Australia, the, uh, or if you went to Mars, but not no, with rabbits, but, <laughs> but of course... <laughs> with Mormons. <laughs> with Mormons, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That would like diseases or... Yeah. yeah. In the, in, in the space agencies, there's actually people that have a job that is dedicated to that, just to that. They're called planetary protection officers, which is the coolest job True. name that there is <laughs> in, ever. <laughs> um, and and they, they think about that, just, oh, okay, how, what do we need to do to the spacecraft so that it, when it comes back, it doesn't bring anything nasty, or that we don't bring anything nasty to Mars, how do we need to clean the spacecraft, so that's... Uh, that's a whole field of uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Sebastian, can you tell us what are you currently working on? Yeah. Um, so, like we talked about, the, it's a big problem uh, when you are uh, traveling in space that, that, that your muscles, they, they, they disappear and, and your bones as well, they, they, they start to decompose. Um, so, we are in the Sega Architects, we're working on a, on a deep space workout machine, actually. Uh, with the German... Uh, is, that, is that how you agency. get these results? Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's purely from that. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, yeah, no, so, so they're working out a lot right now, but the big, the big workout machines they have, they have especially one that's called an A-RED. A -red. It's an American uh, workout machine, and it's like 600 kilograms. It's a big monster. Uh, and what we are trying to do is, is create a, a workout machine that we can fit inside a shoebox. Um, um, so that's one thing. Another thing is, uh, right now there's not so much architecture in space, uh, so we are trying to uh, develop architecture on Earth that is relatable to space. So for example, we are doing a, a simulated habitat in the desert of Israel, which is, uh, which is similar to yours, not as extreme, not, it's not 520 days, it's a little less, but it's also six people going out into the desert and uh, living as if it was on the surface of Mars. Didn't you try something like that? Uh, I mean, in your yeah. bio, you went to a desert for a couple of weeks. Yeah, so, so the Martian is filmed in, in a desert in Jordan. 
uh, called Wadi Rum, which is like this beautiful uh, red desert. And, and me and my partner, we, we went there uh, to stay in, in isolation uh, and drank powdered food and, and, and had a very boring time, actually. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but it was great. <laughs> Did you kill any microbes? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Diego, what are you currently working on? I mean, you did cover some of these yeah, things. Yeah, uh, space resources, basically mm -hmm. making uh, space travel more affordable. Uh, we are helping the government of Luxembourg to come up with a strategy for, for space resources. There are the I'm sorry, the government of Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yeah. There are, right now, Luxembourg and the program. US are the, they do have a very recent uh, like space exploration program. They're starting but they are willing to really invest in space resources. They are a very small country, but they're very clever. They, 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 the communications uh, satellites, they were the first ones to, to see that there was a, a good thing to do, and now they have the largest uh, uh, telecommunications operator in the world in the small Luxembourg, which is SES. And uh, now they saw that space resources are a thing and they are deciding to invest in it. So they, they're, they're really... So it's driven by the government of Luxembourg? Government of Luxembourg, yeah. They're on the edge of space travel? They are on the edge, yeah. That's it's fantastic. Very good. Yeah. 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 Incredible. So, so you, you're still working at the European Space Agency? Uh, no, I work at a, at a company called Space Application Services in Belgium where we both do contracts for the European Space Agency, but we also do research projects with the European Union, so we have the best of both worlds, and then also we operate um, uh, the first commercial uh, rack to, for, in Europe for people to send experiments to space that is called ice cubes, so anybody that has a nice idea to run in space can do it, and now instead of costing uh, hundreds of thousands of euros or millions of euros even to develop an experiment for space uh, for the dozens of thousands of euros. Uh, a university uh, company, they can make their experiment and have the astronauts uh, operating their, their experiments. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite exciting what's, uh, what's happening. Yeah. So, buddy, any current research that you're involved in? Yeah, as, I'm, as a scientist, I'm studying galaxies. So you can call my field of research galactic archaeology. So I'm studying active galactic nuclei. So imagine every galaxy, like our Milky Way, has a supermassive black hole in the center. And if there is mass to feed the black hole, to fall inside, sometimes you can have a jet... <coughs> a jet of energy going out of the supermassive black hole. Such kind of objects are called galaxies with active nuclei, and those were part of the history of every galaxy. So I'm scouting to understand more about the history of our own Milky Way, why the Milky Way got its formed, how was every galaxy formed in the beginning, and I'm also doing a lot of science communication. I'm here with some of my students in our master degree in astronomy and popularization of astronomy. And in one hour after the discussion, they will learn how to take part in such panels. So I'm also doing a lot of teaching and science communication for kids, for grown-ups. Right. I was well, wondering, because uh, yeah. uh, I just have a limited mind as things about the moon and Mars and traveling there. Mm -hmm. What do you think about interstellar travel? Uh, is well, that okay. going to be possible anytime soon? <laughs> well, well, it depends. Uh, it depends. So, if you are, say, a photon, this means that, of course, you can travel with the speed of light, and it takes four years for you, a photon, to go to Proxima Centauri, the closest star to Earth other than the Sun. But if you are speaking from an engineering and a scientist point of view, I think that we need new engineering how to say, breakthroughs, to go and to reach 30, 40, 50 percent of the speed of light. If we can do this, this means that we can go in 8 or 12 years to Proxima Centauri B, the closest exoplanet to the closest star, and then do some research, one, two, five years, and go back. So I think that we need breakthroughs in engineering in, uh, in, in propulsion methods. And if you are speaking of interstellar, li like in the movie, like like traveling through wormholes? Well, it's, uh, it's just a hypothesis because to open a wormhole, this means that you have to use a form of matter that doesn't exist. You have to use an exotic matter that has a repulsive 
uh, repulsive force of gravity. So this is a matter that is not discovered anywhere. This means that for the moment, wormholes are just a hypothesis. So I would say that invest more in education of engineers, in scientists, and then invest more in breakthrough research projects like, like, like your project to go to, to the moon and your architectural things, because we need a way to stay on Mars, stay on the moon, and then we need to use space resources to make spacecrafts that can travel 30 to 50 percent with the speed of light. And I think this will be feasible in the next 10 to 15 years. Speaking mm. about 10 to 15 years, mm. can you guys make your estimation if we are to imagine a viable colony of, let's say, 200 people on Mars? When? Well, I would say 10th of November 2035. 35? Yeah, at, 35. at 9 a.m.? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at 11 a.m. 200 people, so 11 a.m. Okay, two yeah. hours more. <laughs> uh, th that's dangerous because, uh, the, you know, I think all generations of astronauts, they've been told that they are the generation to go to Mars. Um, mm. uh, so that's a dangerous estimate. I can say that I, I, when I was a kid, I, I read uh, a quote saying that uh, my generation was born too late to explore Earth and born too early to, to uh, explore space. Mm. And that was the most depressing thing I heard, uh, <laughs> or that I read. Um, and, then, uh, and then I learned some more and then I found out that it might actually be in my uh, lifetime and in, in my generation. And so if it's just within that span, then I'm, I'm satisfied. Within that span? Yeah. Until you're 90, let's say. Optimistic. Well, maybe we live a little longer, yeah. so we can give them a little bit more, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Diego, so what do you think? I, I think that so I'm, I'm I'm optimistic, but I think that um, the, for Mars we're a little bit uh, far away, and um, and this is because we are, do not have made a decision to to do this. Uh, the Mars was 30 years away when we landed on the Moon, then 10 years later, then 10 years later, and today we're 30 years away from <laughs> land going to Mars. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe a little bit further down in time, and I think that uh, first uh, we will have m more people working in cis lunar space, uh, which is which is uh, Earth orbit and uh, and uh, all the space between there and and the Moon. Uh, people working on the surface of the Moon in orbit around the Moon. Soon there's going to be a, a, a space station around the Moon that is called the um, okay they changed the name Deep Space Gateway it used to be called now it's Lunar. Gateway. gateway, yeah, okay. And uh, so I think that maybe 100 people working in cis lunar space within the next 15, 25 years, uh, it, it's possible. That's where I would put my money on. Mm. Right. I like that. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation. I wish you good luck in your future endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Welcome our panel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Земля в иллюминаторе видна, как сын грустит о матери.